Good morning, FOR 345. Welcome to another exciting soils lecture. Last week I told you I would see you, but I can see your vision and you can see me. I'm live here in the ESF studio at, and really, and I'm living in Baltimore this week at the soils meeting, hence my absence. So here we go, I'd like to um, thank this ESF studio. This is the greatest place and, and let's, let's rock to another day of soils. So we're gonna start finish up soil temperature today and we'll start aeration and when we get to the end of this lecture this is where we draw the line for the exam that you have in just two more days on Wednesday. I've uh, got like my little comic here remember this uh, this song clowns to the right of me jokers to the left well this, this is a nice play probably most of you are too young to know that song as, as many of the songs I have to refer to but um, so I thought this was a good play on that. So what's going on? Remember, this is a no lab this week. Give you a chance to look and prepare for the exam. Uh, exam two is coming up. And of course, the review sheet is in the Blackboard folder. It covers physical properties, soil water, soil temperature, soil aeration, all the way up to the end of this lecture. And that will be, um, and then we'll worry about next exam. So last time we were at the end of soil moisture and we then finished up soil moisture and began soil temperature. And we started with the big view of soil temperature, the three interacting factors that affect soil temperature. We talked about albedo and incoming solar radiation. And we went and broke that down a little more. We talked about latitude and elevation, and slope and aspect, depth and soil cover and how those individually affected the soil temperature. And we left off at soil thermal properties, kind of fine tune some of that. So we left off with this equation and we pick up talking about heat transfer in soil, heat transfer in soil and QH and as proportional to K delta T over X. And we'll kind of go through this. So what is this heat transfer? So we're looking at QH, the quantity of heat transferred across a unit cross section, across an area, right? And, and so per unit timing. So you know this, or we'll know it soon, is something called thermal flux. And the other part of that is the change in temperature. You see part of that delta T, so the difference in temperature between one end of that space and the other. And this is a gradient. The greater that gradient, the greater the rate of transfer. And conductivity, K. So this is... a um, in the fourth, last edition of Weil and Brady, we used K, and this was this way to express thermal conductivity. We've already looked at K, the expression of conductivity for saturated and unsaturated flow, and now we think about that in terms of flux of temperature and heat energy. Okay? And so there it is, there it is in our equation, right? We have K, and now here's where K is. So this is thermal conductivity, okay? And this is, ex this is expressed as a function, determining factor of heat transfer. And so in the 15th edition, this is lambda. So for some reason, now it's lambda before it was K, but you'll see it in both. So if you look at the last edition of the text, you'll see it as K. And if you look at the current edition, which most of us have, you'll see it as lambda. So lambda is an important number, right? It, it expresses a flux, it expresses a rate and so what influences lambda? Okay, so lambda. So the, the big one in capital letters here, soil moisture. Okay, that's the numero uno factor influencing heat flux in soil. This hydraulic, not hydraulic, this thermal conductivity. Now, once we account for moisture, there are some other factors. And moisture is so overriding, I put it in big caps. But then we get down to organic matter content. We get down to soil texture and bulk density. So very similar to the things that affect water flow. Okay? And now we'll look at this from the effect, the impact on the flux of energy. And it's kind of nicely summarized in this piece in the book, in figure 736. And here we have lambda. And so in the old one, it's K in the new edition. So you'll see the new edition, these nice colors. The older edition is the greens and the green shades. So the same basic picture, but with a nice color. And, and so low thermal conductivity, and this is it. There's little connection between the particles, a lot of airspace, and dry soil. And, and so remember that insulation, your insulation in your house is largely airspaces. 
So when you have packing a lot of airspace, you disturb or you make discontinuous the particle connection. And so the rate of transfer of heat energy, the rate of temperature change is very, very slow. So if you want to slow down the rate of temperature, the rate of heat transfer, uh, just put in a little bit of insulation, add a lot of air. Okay. How do we increase that K, that lambda, that thermal flux, thermal conductivity? Well, you increase it by putting the particles closer together, also reducing the airspace. Right? And, and so when you do that, that increases particle contact and the rate of transfer of energy, the thermal flux increases thermal conductivity. And how do we really increase it? Well, like I said, moisture is big. So this one here over on the right shows a lot of added moisture. So if you fill all those pores with moisture, all of a sudden you've made a connection and you've driven up the thermal conductivity. So if you think about it dry, the more airspace, the lower the thermal conductivity. So things like, what about bulk density? So lower bulk density, high total pore space, lower organic matter, okay? means lower organic matter will put things together. A lot of organic matter keep them apart. So organic matter, bulk density, and texture all affect this because if you have more air-filled pore space, you have a lower rate of thermal conductivity. Throw in the moisture, pour in the water, all bets are off. Now you're connecting the particles by water and you have a nice high, a higher, I don't know if I can say nice, but a higher thermal conductivity. And that's a, that's a pretty good summary of those, moist, of those three factors and kind of integrated in this diagram 7.36. Soil temperature and root growth. So now we'll think about what this means for the biota. And so there's a range. And in, in most of our northern species, this was from some Norway spruce and some northern hardwoods. This, these data actually for Norway spruce seedings. About 10 to 25 C is the optimal. The minimal range, 0 to 7 and the maximum range 25 to 35. So once you get up to these high temperatures, you're really starting to fry enzymes and having a real negative impact. All of a sudden you're driving respiration to the point where just all the carbon's used up and, and soon you denature enzymes and it's, uh, the system breaks down. There's a picture of that. This is out of a publication, a Canadian publication, Farndon's, uh, some of his work with nursery and seedlings. And here we have Norway spruce, and it illustrates these ideas with some actual data. And here we have roots, of course, and shoots. And you can see in that optimal range here, we, the range not too different from what we just cited. The maximum range is starting to die as you hit past 30 degrees C. And the minimum range in the, in the 0 to 7. So you remember this number, 5 degrees C. Okay, this 5 degrees C. It's kind of smack dab in that middle, that idea of biological zero. So this is, has some applications and implications for reforestation, for planting. We do a lot of planting, and, and many times after a harvest and conifer stands, we'll replant. Of course, here in the Northeast, we don't do that. We have, we have a lot of nice natural regeneration. So we usually rely on natural regeneration hardwoods. But in many parts of the, where we have production forestry and plantation forestry, the planting is key. And, and so we consider soil temperature in our reforestation efforts because it has an impact. And so where is soil temperature get a little bit out of hand or a little too high? Well, we look in the Southwest in the Western United States and South aspects and dry soils. So soil temperature can become a neg negative and we have to kind of mitigate against that. Uh, prescribed burns, there's a lot of prescribed burns in some of these systems and that darkens the soil and so that can elevate the temperature. So there are some practical implications of temperature in terms of reforestation when you're trying to plant things. There's the other end of that, too cold, right? The deficient soil temperature, not warm enough to get things growing rapidly enough to make those seedlings get through, the, get through and get ready for winter. Okay? High elevation systems, low soil temperatures, northern latitudes, and then low temperature becomes an issue. So we have high temperatures, we're in drier areas that can become an issue, low temperatures and then more northern latitudes and the higher elevations. And again, a part of the implications of the soil temperature on trying to reforest and regenerate, regenerate these systems. Here's a nice little picture that shows the planting window on soil temperature. So this shows a variety of phenological uh, development. 
And, and this is the growing season, early spring to late fall. And it's in the early spring, these seedlings and, and the trees are coming out, they're dehardening. All of a sudden they get this pulse of root growth okay, in this early spring, it slows down. And as that root growth slows down, the diameter growth and the above ground growth takes off. Right? So you see at the same time, root growth slowing down, elongation of shoots, elongation of leaves and buds starting to, to increase greatly. And then diameter growth and height growth. And so diameter growth and then diameter growth peaks and drops down as we get towards mid-season, mid-summer going to the fall. And so where is the optimum place, the optimum planting window? And it's here, just as you get, um, just as you come off of the shoot elongation slowing down, root growth is heating up. And all the way down to, to late fall, where root growth, just you want to hit this just before you get this next pulse of root growth. So soil temperature is a big driver of this. And so it gives us a window of planting for when we reforest. So this is a practical implication, a practical application of the soil temperature ideas. Pretty neat. Of course, we don't plant many conifer stands anymore in the Northeast, uh, really, but where's the big planting? We plant a lot in the Southeast, so that we're doing all this work for Labole and Pine our pulp basket, and in the Northwest, a lot of planting and culture of Douglas fir and, and various other places in the world. And so for us, uh, the planting window is a little wider, right, because we have a little longer season. But in more limited environments, you go way up north, it narrows. You go into the drier area, it narrows. So that's some pretty neat stuff in terms of practical applications of understanding soil temperature. And there's some more neat stuff. And so I have a picture here. And so uh, what, what am I showing here? I show you some fence posts and all of a sudden these fence posts look like they're not where they belong, right? They're elevated. You see these little spots here. And so what's going on here? And so this is a classic example of frost heaving. Okay? So frost heaving disturbs and physically moves things into places that it, it hurts infrastructure. And if you're running nursery seedlings uh, and you get frost heaving, you've lost your crop. So frost heaving is a big issue, can be a big issue in forest nurseries. This picture here from Bob Evans, the Saratoga State Tree Nursery. If you take the advanced forest soils cast this spring, we make a full day field trip to this, so it's kind of cool. So consider that, FOR 535. Here's my, here's my plug. Here's my plug for the, the spring course, and it's a, it's a pretty neat course. So uh, think about it, look it up in the catalog, and then and ask me about it, and I'll say, yeah, take my course. It's cool. So what is frost heaving? We need to kind of talk about it, maybe define it. And so how would we define it? Well, probably a concise way to do that is to talk about how it's formed and what it does. And so, so frost heaving, you get the formation of segregated ice lenses. right? Segregated ice lenses, individual lenses growing in pieces. And what happens when ice freezes, okay? when water freezes? You get a volumetric expansion, okay? and so an increase in volume. And this results in shifting. And so this essentially describes frost heaving. So to get that, there are three requirements. First, there's the prolonged period of sub-freezing temperatures. You've got to get down to those lower temperatures, and they have to be for a bit of a time. So a prolonged period of sub-freezing temperatures. That's the first requirement. Second, there's got to be a source of water. You need to continually expand and grow those ice crystals. And so you can't do that unless there's some source of water. And so that's the second piece of this requirement. So we've got temperatures, sub-freezing, we have water, and the next, we have a little nuance. And, and the nuance is the finer grain soils, finer texture, tend to be a little more susceptible. Okay. And so why would that be? So the finer grain soils give us a greater chance to move water, a greater rate of unsaturated flow. So we can connect last week with this idea of saturated flow and unsaturated flow and texture, and then think about this is to understand or think about the nuances of the ease or the increased ability of water to be transported in fine textured soils compared to coarse textured soils. Okay. So it's not exclusive. You can still get frost heaving. Those soils at the Saratoga Nursery are sandy and loamy sands, but they're much more susceptible as you add more uh, finer textures. 
pretty neat. So how about a picture? So the text, the Wild and Brady, has a pretty nice illustration of this, and it's 732. So it starts out here. Here's our plant, a radish plant, a seedling plant, whatever. Here's a stone down here in the fence post. And here we are in the fall, and all of a sudden the temperatures get cold, and ice crystals start to accumulate. So these ice crystals grow and coalesce, and they shift. And when they shift, they increase in volume. And as this is all happening at the surface, there's a little bit of a break here, right? So you have this, this material being pushed up, and all of a sudden uh, the plant root here finds itself in a rather precarious position. Uh, it's broken. The stone finds itself being pushed up a little bit. So that grows. You seem to have a continued source of water and continued transport. And those ice crystals grow and coalesce even further. And this becomes thicker. And the displacement is now complete. Eventually, it warms up again, thankfully. Uh, come back from Florida and come back to your house and you've warmed up. And you see the stones have been pushed up. The roots are now disconnected, and the fence post is up. So we have this shifting all to this volumetric expansion of water as these ice crystals coalesced. And this is the ultimate, the kind of the nice picture history of an example of frost heaving. So thinking about that a little more in depth, and what's going on? There's a thermodynamic sink. So you have this freezing front, right? So we have these water coalescing, this freezing front, and there's a sink. Water is being drawn to that sink, and it's thermodynamically being drawn. And then there are three gradients, okay? So we discussed last time in water movement, in hydraulic and unsaturated conductivity and saturated conductivity, we talked about water moving in response to a gradient, and we worked all the way back through potential, right? And so now we can think about this in terms of this freezing this freezing area, this little, this little interface as the water freezes and excluded, we have three things going on. So we have a thermal gradient, right? And a thermal gradient, so warm to cold. So water is moving from warm to cold. And so it's, it's warmer below, the freezing front is up at the surface and it's colder, and, and water moves toward that freezing front. So this is the thermal gradient, drawing water to the freezing front. There's an osmotic gradient, right? And so remember osmotic gradient that water moves from areas of low concentrations to high concentrations of solute. It moves from clean water, or let's say relatively clean water to salty water. And, and so when you're freezing, okay, you're performing, you have this ice and the ice is pushing water out. So what's happening now is, is you have this gradient so that at that freezing front, Okay. You have an, an osmotic gradient. Water's tending to move as you're, wa you're having water and you drop out all the solutes. Water's moving from this low solute concentration of soil to these solutes being excluded at the freezing front. Okay. So two gradients, both working together, and water is moving toward that freezing front. And there's a last one. There's moisture. Right? So the moisture concentration moves from high concentration to low concentration or from thinking about the other way, thinking about low potential to high potential. And, and so as your freeze, this freezing front is drawing water through from this moisture gradient, there's more moisture in the soil, okay, you have this continual source, and it's being drawn to this desiccated, dehydrated, frozen front. So those three pieces, the thermal gradient, the osmotic gradient, and the moisture gradient, all drawing water to that freezing front. And this ice growth continues, and again, we've got sub-freezing temperatures, and as well as sub-freezing temperatures, we have a continual supply of water. Cut off the water supply, and this process just shuts down. Right? Cut off the sub-freezing temperatures, and it stops. Nice diagram of that. This was out of a long time ago, out of a, a colleague, um, Giles Marion, put something together. He worked for the um, for the, this for a couple of research organizations, and th this was nice. So I borrowed this. I continue to use it. It's dated. But this is a nice illustration. It shows in the hatches frozen soil up here. And here's the frozen fringe where water is freezing. Okay? And so here's unfrozen soil. So we have a temperature gradient. So we're going from warm to cool, okay? or cool to warm, drawing water who. 
we have a salt concentration gradient. Okay? Salt is being squeezed out of here, and so we have higher, we have low potential here and higher potential here and lower potential here. So this difference in osmotic gradient, relatively unsalty to this frozen fringe, and then the temperature gradient. It's all again those all working together. So it's, it's kind of neat. And it's illustrated here on this on this axis. We see cold to warm. It's cold at the surface, warm going down. The potential of water low to high, and as you get towards the as you get toward the um, frozen fringe, the potential is reduced. Pretty nice. So that, that kind of completes our work on soil temperature. It wraps up where we began last week, uh, last Wednesday, and finishes it up. And now we begin to talk about soil aeration. And so here's a, a sunrise. So I took this, I do a do a pretty 21 mile bike ride every morning and just uh, get back around sunrise. And this is, this is the picture uh, just not too far from uh, between Marcellus and Skinny Atlas. And so here's our sunrise on aeration. So let's consider first the composition of the atmosphere. Uh, what are the three main gases? So nitrogen, 78%, oxygen, 21%, carbon dioxide, 410 parts per million, right? Now, I, mean, I remember it was, it was uh, in the low 300s when I, was a, when I was a student, and so never thought it would go up to 400, you know, break 400, and here we are, we've broken 400 ppm. So rather extraordinary times. But so, so these are the concentrations in the atmosphere. And so parts per million, you can convert to percent, and so this is percent, 0.041. And remember, this parts per million is parts per 10 to the minus 6, right? So you have 0, 0, 0. And if you look at that, the percent, that's 0.041%. So you should be able to make that conversion. Okay? So that's the atmosphere. And let's consider how that's different from the soil air, the soil atmosphere. So nitrogen is relatively inert. It's the, bulk of the, it's the bulk of the volume of the gases. And it's about the same concentration in soil air. Oxygen in the atmosphere, 21%. It's lower in the soil atmosphere, in the soil atmosphere. And, and we'll see why it's being used up. Carbon dioxide, 410 parts per million, or 0.041%. It's higher in the soil. And the how much lower and how much higher, this depends on the degree of aeration. And so well, now we've got a motivation to think about aeration. We have something to compare to. Right? We have the atmosphere. So we can talk about the atmosphere above the soil and the atmosphere within the soil. And so let's continue down that pit, so to speak. So th those aren't the only three. There's a lot of other ones. There are small concentrations, big importance, like methane and hydrogen sulfide and so forth. And, and ethylene, all kinds, all kinds of pretty cool gases, but in very small concentrations. But not to say they're not important. Methane just way outpowers carbon dioxide in terms of its impacts on its ability to trap heat. So all these are important. But for our purposes, in terms of just thinking about aeration, we'll kind of focus on oxygen and carbon dioxide for now. And the fact that there are lower oxygen concentrations in the soil air, higher concentrations of carbon dioxide in the soil air, and about the same as nitrogen. So we could ask, what is a well-aerated soil? What do we mean? So the definition helps. So when we're talking about a well-aerated soil, we're talking about gas exchange sufficiently rapid. So we like to have these little phrases that kind of lead up. So these are, these are five little words that are quite important. A well-aerated soil, the gas exchange is sufficiently rapid to replenish oxygen. Okay? So who's using oxygen, the roots are using it, the organisms are using it, all the aerobic organisms, um, just has to be replenished or the system kind of comes to a halt or slows down. The other thing you gotta get rid of is the gases that are toxic and to the aerobic organisms. CO2 is, is um, a buildup of that is, uh, reduces productivity and actually can lead to some, um, to death and to death and destruction. Um, it slows the system down. So you want to replenish the oxygen and prevent the buildup of CO2. So the gas exchange has got to be rapid enough to do that. 
Okay, so that's a well aerated soil. We have enough oxygen that's keep coming in. We're greening out the CO2. So what we can think of next, we've got a well aerated soil. What regulates oxygen availability in the soil atmosphere? So who's using it? So the first thing it regulates is how fast you can move it. And air and water, largely water moves through macrophores. It's either filled with air or filled with water. So macroporosity, texture and structure, three big ones. So the, macro, the more macropores, the greater the chance the water is going to leave under gravity, and the better the aeration. Texture and structure contribute to pore size distribution. We've talked about the impacts of pore size with fine textured clays and small pores, a larger proportion of micropores. We've talked about the large proportion of macropores and sandy soil. And we've talked about structure and the improved effect of porosity, macroporosity due to structure. Nice, well-developed granular structure increases macropores. Macropores allow water to drain. Water drains, allowing air to move through. So these three factors regulate availability. And these are the physical factors. And so we're essentially continuing on our lecture and our ideas from soil physical properties as we translated those into soil water and now kind of think about what that means for aeration. And again, aeration is the other side of water, right? If you have no water in pores, you have a way to move air through and vice versa. And so the soil water content, the air filled porosity, right? the total porosity, how much of that is filled with air, how much is filled with water. So that's going to govern the capacity to make oxygen, move oxygen through, as well as move carbon dioxide out. And finally, the users, O2 consumption. Who's using roots? Who's using O2? The roots, the soil organisms, all those aerobic organisms that require oxygen to run respiration, they're consuming oxygen. So these are the three, pretty much the three drivers when we think about how do we determine how much oxygen or how do we assess oxygen availability? These are the three bigger, bigger pieces of that. So that brings us, how does air move into the soil? How does the atmosphere gases, how do they get into the soil? Those fluxes, remember we talked in the beginning about the fluxes of energy, water, and gas. And now we'll focus on the flux of gas in these systems, this, through this biogeochemical membrane, which we call the soil. And there's two ways to do it. Right? There's mass flow, so simply by air movement, air um, parcels moving around and wind and so forth. And, and the other way is diffusion. And the primary, the primary mechanism here in soils to move air through soil systems, exchange atmospheric air for soil atmospheric air is the process of diffusion. Big letters. So let's illustrate. What is diffusion? So remember from your chemistry that diffusion is the movement of a substance against in response to a gradient. And so this time we're talking about gases in response to a gradient. So this is a little cartoon in the text. Here we have the atmosphere and the soil pore. Here's the soil air interface, so in this little dotted lines, and here are these soil pores. Okay. And so this represents oxygen, is represented with, by the black relative concentration of black dots, and CO2 by the relative concentration of these lighter, I guess, yellowish, 5Y6 over 2, I don't know. <laughs> at, at any rate, the, the movement here is in response to a gradient. So where's it going? Okay. So here we have carbon dioxide, okay, and here, we have, and here we have oxygen. So oxygen, there are a lot more of them, a higher concentration in the atmosphere, 21% to be precise, compared to the soil air. So there's a gradient of high concentration to low concentration of oxygen. And that gradient is in the direction it moves from high from the atmosphere into the soil atmosphere. So this is diffusion of oxygen. For carbon dioxide, it's the reverse. The concentrations, the relative concentrations in the soil are higher than in the air. So there's a diffusion, oops. So there's a tendency for those to diffuse out. 
And so this is the mechanism, diffusion, the movement of molecules and gases in response to a gradient from high concentration to low concentration. And here's a little note, this is worth remembering, this process, it's 10,000 times greater in terms of a flux, 10,000 times greater in air-filled pore spaces than water-filled pore. So that's saying, if you fill a pore with water, you're not going to transfer gases by diffusion. Right? You need a large pore, you've got to have an empty pore, essentially a macro pore, or a pore that has no water in it. And then when you can diffuse, the process will take place. So eliminate those macro pores and really eliminate the flux of oxygen in the flux of CO2 out and limit or constrain aeration. So we've defined it, we think about the process, how it works, and now how do we measure it? How do we assess it, quantify it? So in a number of ways. So the first way we can think about it is just the, the content of O2 and other gases, their partial pressures. And, and so the oxygen, so a general rule of thumb, we need about 10% oxygen to most land plants and most root systems require this. So if you have 10% oxygen in your soil atmosphere, you're good to go. So as you drop below 10%, that's the number, we tend to think about difficulties um, and limited aeration. So we can look at that from carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide, the 10% is the other way. If we exceed 10% concentration of carbon dioxide, then we're in trouble. Right? So either greater than 10% oxygen or less than 10% carbon dioxide, that would be a reasonably well aerated soil. Okay? You start to get numbers above and different from those, then that would indicate a poorly aerated soil. So content of oxygen and other gases, first way to do this. When I, was a, when I was a technician at University of Vermont, we used to take samples of, um, we had looking at soil compaction, and we had a, a several, um, several of these gadgets. We'd bury the permeable, um, actually PVC we'd cap and we'd, we'd cut holes in them so that they would equilibrate the soil air. And then we would withdraw gas samples in a syringe and bring those back to the lab and measure the concentration. So we kind of follow the aeration in that way. Okay, there are other ways to do it, um, related. Another way is to think about air-filled soil porosity. Air-filled porosity. The proportion of soil, of the soil pore space filled with oxygen, macropores. So generally, air-filled porosity is less than 20% of total pore space or less than 10% of the volume. That inhibits plant growth. And so here's a way to think about a, a, rough, a rough idea of aeration just based on the air-filled pore space. We could get a little more in depth and a little, um, a little crazier on the measurement and measure something called the oxygen diffusion rate, abbreviated ODR, oxygen diffusion rate. Okay. And so we measure this, and so this is a flux rate of oxygen, and we measure it in, in the amount per unit area per time, micrograms per centimeter squared per minute. Okay. And here, here are the cutoff values. They're around 0.3 to 0.2, micrograms per centimeter square per minute. So below those values, we start to see a reduction in top growth, and below the 0.2, a reduction in root growth. So this is a threshold measure, a measure we can put in, a, and I'll show you a picture of this. We put in a little probe and measure the oxygen diffusion rate. So we do this by these platinum surfaces. Here's an illustration of it. Here's water and soil particles. And here's oxygen diffusing to this plate, this platinum surface. And we can actually measure that. And so we can get a readout based on the difference in electrical potential and, and essentially get, measure this rate, micrograms per centimeter squared per minute. Okay. It's, it's sensitive. It's a, it's a tough thing to measure. It's, uh, it's sensitive to how you put in your probe. And it's a lot of work. But it's, it's one way to assess aeration, that 0.2 to 0.3 micrograms per centimeter squared per minute. 
So here I got an illustration of an application of this. I had a very good friend in Georgia, a colleague, he had a couple of grad students uh, working on this and looking at two things, looking at, one was looking at Lavaloy pine and one was looking at cotton and some interesting greenhouse studies. And this is, a, he, they had measured, so Scotty Toriano had measured oxygen diffusion rate, and this is in their units, grams 10 to the minus a centimeter square per minute. Okay. And Lavaloy pine. So they looked at Lavaloy pine seedling emergence, right, and it turns out that the rates increased linearly okay, with the log of the oxygen diffusion rate. So here we are down at this low 0.2 to 0.3, and then it takes off. So this is an indication of the impacts of oxygen diffusion rate measured directly based on evaluating the emergence of Lavaloy pine seedlings, so one biological way to do it. Interesting, cotton root biomass in, this, in another study by another grad student, the same kind of rate of, of change with the oxygen diffusion rate, a linear increase in the, in the percent of cotton root biomass growth as a function of the oxygen diffusion rate. Interesting that they both had the same slope. So kind of neat, just some supporting data to show these, uh, to, to show these details of these generalizations, just some supporting data. So we've had, that's two or three ways, and there, there are more ways to assess aeration. So we've looked at the air-filled porous porosity, we've looked at the oxygen diffusion rate, we've looked at the partial pressure, the concentration of oxygen and CO2. We had three so far. And let's, let's go on to a fourth, the redox potential. Redox potential, it's a change in voltage. We represent it as EH, capital E, small h. So this, this is a measure, this change in voltage, a measure of a system tendency to reduce gain electrons Right, or oxidize, lose electrons. Right. Redox potential, a number, a change in voltage that shows us the tendency of a system to gain electrons or lose electrons to reduce or oxidize. And so why does this happen? So in our aerobic systems, of course, we have oxygen around. Oxygen is the electron acceptor. Okay? It's driving respiration, it's, it's collecting electrons. Of course, when you oxidize oxygen, when you oxidize something, electrons flow to oxygen, oxygen itself is reduced. Okay? But in aerobic systems, oxygen is taking on the electrons. And everybody happy, the plants and the animals are going crazy, producing a lot of biomass, respiration's going, the system's happy, and, and we go on and on. And they danced on and on. Now what happens though when you run out of oxygen? And so that we understand that is becoming anaerobic, a lack of oxygen, anaerobic systems. And this has an impact and we can measure it and we think about assessing soil aeration. So what happens when oxygen becomes scarce or is no longer around to take or accept the electrons? Other substances accept the electrons. Other substances open for business, oxygen closes for business, and the system goes on, albeit much slower, right? Aerobic systems are extremely efficient. Anaerobic systems, a fraction of the efficiency. Where are all those electrons coming from? Respiration, respiration. The organism's breaking down sugars, trying to make energy. Respiration. What does that look like? There's glucose. Where those are glucose is, that six carbon sugar. It's converted to pyruvic acid, hydrogens, and electrons, right? So this is a part of respiration, glucose converting to pyruvic acid. If you take biochem, you go through this whole thing, you go through all these cycles. But for now, this just is an illustration showing you that respiration generates electrons, okay? That's the bottom line here. Not that it's two pyruvic acids and four hydrogen, but that respiration generates electrons. Glucose, of course, is the sugar that runs a lot of our processes. We burn up sugar, we get energy. Um, throw a little bit on my ice cream. So eventually, if you don't put the oxygen in, it doesn't keep aerating, you don't move through, you run out. Okay. And let's look at what happens over time. So here we have, we don't put the oxygen back. Here's the concentration over time. 
takes a nosedive, right? So this is out of the text. This is figure 7-7 seven, seven on page 291. So here we are depleting oxygen, not aerating, and it's going down, down, down. At the same time, nitrate is around, okay? So nitrate is the next one down the line. So when oxygen gets low, nitrate becomes the electron acceptor. It's the next one on the electronegative um, species that will take on electrons. So this is an illustration of what's going on with this EH measurement. Okay? We're going from 6.72 to 6.2 to 5.2. The EH is dropping. EH is dropping. You can see that as we run out of oxygen, then eventually we run out of nitrate, EH is dropping further. What's happening then? Manganese starts to pick up the electrons. Okay? Manganese is reduced, takes the electrons, EH drops further. Iron, you know, our old friend iron becomes reduced. EH drops further, okay, it's kicking up the electrons. Hydrogen sulfide, we run out of iron, hydrogen sulfide becomes the main collector of electrons, that stinky swamp gas. And then last, we get down to these really, really reduced conditions, methane, we produce methane. What's happening to the pH? The pH is going up in this system as they become more and more anaerobic. So as you become anaerobic, wetter and wetter, less and less dissolved oxygen, less and less dissolved, everything going down, down the tubes, so to speak, the anaerobic tubes, pH is increasing. So this is interesting. We'll talk a lot about pH in our last unit, our last lab, okay? But for now, just note that as we become more anaerobic, the drainage becomes poorer, the pH tends to go up. We'll explore that later. Not much later, a few more weeks, the semester will be over, oh my God. But one thing at a time. So this is the cartoon, okay? and this is how it appears in the text. Okay? EH going down, this is the same pattern, but now with some nice colors, pH going up, oxygen depleted, Nitrate picking up the electrons, nitrate depleted, sulfate picking up the electrons, manganese, all the way down to production of methane. Okay? Showing the EH dropping, here we are at 0.6, dropping down to minus 0.2 in this range. The pH going up from about a 5.2 range to 7.2. And this just puts some numbers along with these processes. Aerobic up here. All right, aerobic. Oxygen around, oxygen disappears. What do we call this? Anaerobic. All right, so we get below down here, we're anaerobic. Poor aeration. Right, so we go from good aeration to poor aeration to anoxic. As the oxygen depletes, other electron acceptors pick up the electrons and we produce stinky hydrogen sulfide when we get down here. So we could think about that. We've thought about that as EH, right? and now we could think about that in terms of oxygen diffusion rate. And these are some data from the uh, north, from the Valley Bog Peat, showing the EH and how that relates to ODR. Right? So you might expect, since these assess aeration and anoxic conditions, that they're related. And indeed they are. So as the ODR increases, remember that's one measure, we're down here at the 0.2 to 0.3 micrograms per centimeter square per second, as that increases, the EH increases. So they are related. How about those, elect how about those electrons? So here's a picture of FeO plus two. FeOH plus three, okay? And this is where FeO accepts electrons. Okay? Add electrons to it, make it the FeO plus three. Iron's oxidized, where do the electrons go? The electrons go to water, okay? And to do that, you gotta have oxygen. So thankfully, oxygen's around, it accepts the electrons. 
What happens when oxygen gets electrons? It's reduced to water. No problem as long as you keep feeding the oxygen in. The electrons go to O2. What must be reduced? Oxygen is reduced. But it's doing the oxidizing. Cool, right? And so when you see this little system going from FeO to FeOOH, going from oxidation to oxidized to reduced, this is the thing you see. But what we always leave out is all the little details. So the little details remind you that the electrons are moving on. You gain electrons and you reduce something. You lose electrons, you oxidize something. So that's, those are some quantitative ways. There's, there's still other ways, you know, you kind of quantitative. And I guess you'd say quantitative, and, and we'll talk about why. But one of these new methods, this is out in the last 10 years, uh, some work that Marty Ravenhurst and others had done at University of Delaware, something called IRIS, and IRIS for short, or an, um, a mnemonic for indicator of reduction in soils. Iris, so kind of neat. So essentially you take these tubes and paint them with an iron oxide paint and see how long it takes the paint to flick off or if it does flick off. Here's a picture of these. These are samples from the increasing um, anoxic conditions as we go from wetland. And what happens when you put these in the ground? Okay? If things are anoxic and you don't have dissolved oxygen, the iron's reduced and the paint peels. So you have a visual expression of the degree of anaerobic conditions, okay? because iron is being reduced, and when it's reduced, it's soluble, and off goes the paint. Pretty neat, right? So you can actually take these, and you can convert these and measure the area using a little bit of, um, of photo technology, and come up with a quantitative estimate uh, to try to re relate that to these other measures. So this was, we had, this was, those pictures were from a site we had in Montezuma uh, Refuge. This was oh, about 10, 15 years ago now. Uh, and to try these out, we were out looking at these. And clearly wetlands, clearly anaerobic, clearly in anoxic conditions, and they perform very well. Okay, there's another set of tubes, Myris. So manganese indicator of reduction in soils. So iris was iron hit the iron, and these for manganese. And so why bother? Well, manganese, this takes, when you get into higher pHs, it's uh, sometimes, it kind of stops some of these reactions. So when we're into higher pH systems, we use these manganese, manganese indicator reduction, the Myris tubes. And the same deal, as you get into more anoxic conditions, the manganese is reduced, right, gains electrons, and then this is the result, the paint peels. And this only takes, you know, within a month, uh, this, this occurs. So it's kind of a, a quick and a rather relatively quick and easy way to get an indicator of aeration in anaerobic or anaer anaerobic conditions. So it's just, a, and again, relatively recently, the last 15 years. So I think this is pretty cool. So here we have Myris tubes all labeled going down and here in well air well drained sites okay so let's um if we can think about back to eh let's think about what is and we we had a quantity right we had a number measured in volts and we might ask what is the eh of a well drained soil as an indicator of aerobic conditions okay and, and so let's look at what happens. Here's the oxidized form and reduced form and the EH change, okay? So oxygen, O2, it's reduced, when it, O2 accepts electrons, it's reduced to water, okay? And as that gets depleted, you get less and less oxygen, it's all turned to water, the EH changes, so somewhere between 0.38 and 0.32, okay? So above here, okay, this is, relatively aerobic. As you go through this phase, you're getting into anaerobic. And so next on the list, remember our cartoon, nitrate. Nitrate became the electron acceptor, run out of oxygen. Nitrate picks up the job, and nitrate is reduced to dinitrogen. You know it as nitrogen gas, N2. And this occurs as this depletes somewhere between 0.28 and 0.22 volts. 
Manganese is next, and this follows right along with the cartoon we just showed, the diagram out of the book, taken apart in my little dots and dashes. Manganese is reduced plus four to plus two. It takes the electrons. And now we're looking at an EH change as this becomes depleted, the 0.22 to 0.18 range. After, after manganese, iron, iron plus three is reduced, plus two, right? it's gaining electrons. And now we're changing, you're going through the EH range of minus, uh, 0.11 to 0.08. By the time you get down to sulfate, you're producing hydrogen sulfide gas, and now you're down to negative numbers, okay? And then finally, carbon dioxide, the acceptor to methane, very negative numbers. So extremely anoxic, and above here, aerobic. So we could ask, we could look at this and say, what is the EH of a well-drained soil? And if we were to look at this and think about where oxygen is depleted, we'd have to conclude that the EH of a well-drained soil is somewhere between 0.4 and 0.7 volts. So this is a, no, a threshold. So we have thresholds so far for oxygen concentration, air-filled porosity. We have thresholds for CO2 concentration, 10%. We have thresholds for EH, or the, e, um, the um, yeah, EH, this EH 0.4 to 0.7 volts. We have a, we have a threshold for the, for the um, oxygen diffusion rate, the ODR, 0.2 to 0.3 micrograms per cube, centimeter cube per minute, centimeter squared. So we have a number of different thresholds that we can use as, um, as little tests or little indicators of do we have a well-drained system, a well-aerated system. Okay. So those are very useful points to know. Okay, so we've quantified it. We've kind of described it. We've looked at it from all ways of thinking about the process. And now we'd like to wrap that back up, come back to the beginning and think about what are the factors that affect soil aeration. And so we, in reiterating this, we'd have to talk about macropore space, right? And so what's controlling macropore space? And things we've talked about already in physical properties and continue to talk about in soil water, it's texture, it's aggregate stability and structure, it's bulk density and organic matter. So these are the big drivers from our physical properties understanding of macropore space. Texture, sandy soils, greater proportion of macropores. Stable granular structure and fine textured soils, stable macropore space. Lower bulk densities, generally more total pore space. And we try to think about, a lot of times, more macropore space. And organic matter, low density, contributes to structure. So again, we connect these ideas with a well-aerated soil, with soil physical properties. Uh, and it's important to keep this in mind. We'll come back to this. So in the final exam, the cumulative final, you'll have to kind of recall some of this and think about the factors that contribute to aeration and relate those to physical properties. Okay. And then depth in the profile. That was the last thing we talked about in um, in the CO2 production, the last thing we talked about in temperature. And so now we bring it into macropore space and bring that back around. So here we are with the soil physical properties that affect macropore space because they lead directly to well aeration or poor aeration. And then the consumers, the biochemical reaction rates. What's, who are the users? We've got the roots. We've got the higher organisms, the earthworms and the coleoptera. We have the microbes, the fungi, we have the bacteria, they're decomposing organic residues. All these critters from micro to macro are generating carbon dioxide and utilizing oxygen. Okay? So the collective intersection of all this is the ability of well aerated soils to continually support high rates of biological activity. So we think about high rates of biological activity. We want to grow food, we want to grow trees, aerobic systems, aerobic systems, well aerated soils, higher rates of productivity. And season. 
these interact the season, not unlike water, right? Here's a nice illustration. So this is, a, from, this is an older one, the 13th edition of Brady. They don't have this in this beautiful form, but I, li I like it, so I continue to use it. And it shows the interaction of depth and season. Now we've talked about season and depth interacting with the water, uh, soil water, and now we kind of segue that and talk about its interacting in terms of carbon dioxide. So here's soil depth, and it's June, August, September, November. This is in a cornfield, right? And so we start out in the early part of the growing season. And what do we see? We see increasing carbon dioxide concentration with depth, okay? 0.3 to 0.5% up here at the surface, and all the way to 1 to 2% at depth. And this is June, so the roots are just starting to get going. The crop's taken off, the corn's starting to grow. Come to mid to late June, and these CO2 values, these concentrations have shot up dramatically. Right? We're down here and they change with depth. So again, we get an increase to the surface, but down here at the deeper depth where we have an intense bit of root activity, okay, we're 20 centimeters to 30 and 40 centimeters, we have a very high production of CO2. So it builds up and here greater than 7%. So that's pretty high. And then as we go into August, that activity slows down. They start to get towards harvest season. The roots are slowing down. The corn's all tasseling. And those concentrations drop again okay? and, and drop rather dramatically. And they interact with depth. Okay, and so that's, I've got to stop there. Sorry for going over. I'll be back. You know, good luck on the test, and I'll see you when I get back. May, may the force be with you as you take the exam. The best of luck and, and study hard.